To manage febrile neutropenia, we have to know what it is, which of our systemic anti-cancer therapies can cause it, whether or not we need to give GCSF, how to immediately assess and manage a patient, how to then stratify their risk for serious complications, and of course, how to best educate our patients. Febrile neutropenia has various different definitions and various different names, neutropenic fever or neutropenic sepsis, but essentially they're all the same thing. It's a patient who has a high temperature, usually over 38.3 degrees or 38 degrees for a prolonged period, alongside a low neutrophil count with an absolute neutrophil count of less than 0.5 and we know that a lot of our chemotherapy regimens and some of our other systemic anti-cancer therapy can cause neutropenia to put our patients at risk of this. The majority of our chemotherapy regimens can cause neutropenia, but of course some of our other systemic anti-cancer therapies can as well, although more rarely. So things like our uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors and even immunotherapy can cause in a small number of patients. We're mainly focusing on chemotherapy and chemotherapy can be uh, divided into various risk groups regarding the likelihood of causing febrile neutropenia for our patients. These risk groups are high, intermediate and low and the high risk group has an over 20% chance of causing febrile neutropenia. In those particular patients, we may therefore think about using primary um, prophylaxis with GCSF treatment um, and this um, is recommended both by the ESMO guidelines and by the ASCO guidelines. Um, this is not purely based on just the uh, chemotherapy regimen, but also should consider factors about the disease itself and the patient. And there's a helpful flowchart in the ESMO guidelines advising you to consider patients' age and other comorbidities when looking at the overall risk of febrile neutropenia. As well as primary prophylactic GCSF, we sometimes consider using secondary prophylaxis. So that's in patients who have had a complication involving neutropenia after a previous cycle of chemotherapy when they didn't receive the primary prophylaxis. The decision to do this is slightly more complicated um, and it tends to be reserved for those patients where if we did a dose reduction or if there were delays to treatment, that that could really compromise outcomes. So particularly in the curative setting. For patients in a palliative setting, a dose reduction or a treatment delay may be just as appropriate. If a patient suspected of having febrile neutropenia, they must be very urgently assessed and treated as quickly as possible, and they certainly need to be treated within an hour of them attending the hospital with broad-spectrum intravenous antibiotics. This is because a delay can result in increased duration of hospital stay and also increased mortality. So the immediate assessment, of course, comprises a directed history, examination and resuscitation for those patients who are particularly unwell. The immediate investigations would include a broad panel of blood, so full blood count, kidney function, renal function, coagulation, but also a CRP to check for markers of inflammation, blood cultures, two sets, both from any indwelling lines and also peripheral blood cultures, urine cultures, even in patients who don't have symptoms, and then other cultures can be directed according to symptoms, such as sputum or stool or skin swabs. And most patients also require a chest X-ray. When you are doing this assessment, patients must have that first dose of IV antibiotics as soon as they've had blood cultures. So really very quickly, you don't wait for the results of the investigations. The antibiotics themselves should be broad spectrum and intravenous, but exactly which ones are defined by local guidelines as our patients face different pathogens in different areas. Various algorithms have been developed to try and help us stratify our patients with febrile neutropenia regarding the chance of them having complications or becoming particularly unwell. One of the most commonly used is the MASK score, and that includes various factors, but things like patient's age and comorbidities and the type of cancer they have. At the end of performing this score, you have a number, and if the number is above 21, patients have a lower risk of serious complications of only about 6% and a risk of mortality of only 1%. And this group of patients, after that initial intravenous antibiotic dose, may be able to be switched early to oral antibiotics and even managed at home in an ambulatory setting 
as long as there's adequate patient surveillance for that group of patients. For patients with a lower score than 21, or if the attending physician is worried about them, those patients must be admitted to hospital and kept under very close surveillance as they have a risk of becoming really quite unwell very quickly. The ESMO guidelines have some very helpful details on specific situations, for example patients with indwelling line sepsis or with pneumonia which can be more difficult to manage and also have some additional details about when to de-escalate and escalate antibiotics for those inpatients. We've said that to successfully manage febrile neutropenia, we have to deal with it very quickly. So our patients must know what to look out for and how to contact us if they have a problem. So patients all require detailed information when they start treatment. We have to check that they have an accurate thermometer at home so they can keep an eye on their temperature. And they must also have written information for who to contact, both within normal working hours and outside of hours, if they have a concern that may be febrile neutropenia. Similarly, our colleagues in primary care and in the emergency department must have good guidelines and protocols because a lot of our patients may end up presenting there and they need our support in how to manage these patients. Yeah.